I'll basically just give Emily um, a quick introduction and then Emily, you can take it away. Did you all get the request? Yep. Okay, great. All right. Okay, so today I am pleased to introduce Dr. Emily Balchettis. Dr. Balchettis earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Nebraska at Kearney and her PhD in social psychology from Cornell University. Currently, she is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at New York University and a faculty affiliate of the Institute for Human Development and Social Change. Broadly speaking, Dr. Balchettis does research on how people's motivations, emotions, needs, and goals impact the basic ways they perceive, interpret, and ultimately react to the information around them. Her research has been consistently funded by the National Science Foundation and has been published in um, several top journals in the field, including the um, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Psychological Science, and the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. Today, Dr. Balchettis will be presenting a talk titled Perceiving Leadership, Psychological Factors That Affect Support for Underrepresented Candidates. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Balchettis. I love that the round of applause is like, is Tina, just go really going at it. <laughs> it's, it's fun. This format is, um, is it always poses new challenges, but also gives you an opportunity for some new laughs too. So thank you for the invitation to, to join you. Thank you for your flexibility and finding a new way to, to make these professional and personal connections. It's such a rare and wonderful thing in this, in this world. Um, I, I, I invite you to engage with me however you think works best. So I'll just admit that I have a hard time multitasking and like that is the downside of this virtual format is that there's just a lot to monitor on one screen. So um, if you raise your physical hand, I, uh, that I won't see because of the way that I've set up my screen. Feel free to put it something into the chat or probably best is just to unmute yourself and interrupt me. And I'll know that it's out of love and not um, insult <laughs> that, that you want to interject um, to, ask, to ask anything at any point that you like. So I encourage you to unmute and just ask. And if that's, if that's a little bit too challenging, then go ahead and put it in the chat and I will try to monitor that at the same time. So I'm excited to share this work with you today. Uh, it is something that has been ongoing in our lab for, for quite a long time, but, um, but there's so much that's happening right now. So I'll, I'll do a lot of foreshadowing of what we're currently doing and, and where the future of this work is going. Um, and so of course I invite your comments and your reactions throughout because this is a line of work that's really central to, to my interests right now. This idea of understanding leadership. Let me start with some numbers for you. Maybe. <laughs> 426. Since its inception, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences has handed out 426 nominations for Best Director. Exactly five of those have been handed out to Black directors. Four, this is the number of Black people to ever sit as the governor of any state in American history. This is the number of Black justices to ever sit in the US Supreme Court. Only one Hispanic woman has ever sat as the Supreme Court justice out of 114 that have been appointed in the 229 years of its existence. There's only been one Black woman and one Latina that have ever run Fortune 500 companies since, since Fortune magazine began tracking the total revenue of companies 64 years ago. Only 1% of all venture capitalists are Latinx. Zero. There has been no Black woman ever nominated for Best Director of an Oscar, and no Black person has ever won Best Director of an Oscar. I put all these numbers up here to suggest that there is a diversity epidemic in all facets of leadership throughout all facets of society, that who's leading in terms of the arts and politics and business and all domains of society 
uh, is not a representation of the people. And of course, you can say that, like, well, look at the last um, Congress that's been elected. This is the most racially diverse political body that has existed within the federal government, the current United States Congress. But this best case example of diversification is it still fails to represent the American population. 76% of the current House and Senate identify as non-Hispanic white. And in this, in most regards, our efforts to diversify leadership are actually not even improving. We don't even see the trajectory um, of representation growing. So for example, the rates of Black Fortune 500 CEOs are the lowest that they've ever been in the last 15 years. In that same time period, the proportion of Hispanic presidents at undergraduate institutions granting bachelor's degrees has dropped, and the proportion of Black presidents has stagnated, just as a couple examples. So there's a problem. There's a problem of diversity within leadership and representation within leadership. And of course, this isn't a problem that's that's of contemporary times, right? This has been a historic problem in our in American history. It's just one that we think or that we might have a lay intuition is getting better, but in some regards, it's really not. Which is why our lab and like most of America was super excited when this man decided to announce his run for presidency and in fact won. He was the first, of course, non-white man to uh, earn the seat of the presidency of the United States of America. So when he announced his presidency, of course, there's so much conversation about this and an explicit and profound amount of conversation surrounding his race for many reasons, but one of which includes what his background actually is, right? So he, his mother is white, his father is black Nigerian. Uh, and so a lot of people were talking about, about this, of course, because he's the first non-white man, but also, how are they supposed to make sense of him? How should they socially categorize or socially perceive Barack Obama? This was a lot of the conversation. So of course, there was a lot of polling that was done on this asking, how would you describe Barack Obama? Who is Barack Obama in your mind? And so there were polls that were done, of course, one done in 2006, found that the vast majority of white Americans identified socially perceived Barack Obama as bi or multiracial. And the vast majority of black Americans identified him as black as Barack Obama in fact self identifies. For whatever reason, Zogby thought this was an important social category as well. Uh, frequent Walmart shoppers also um, <laughs> predominantly identify him as bi or multiracial. Just interesting side note for you. Okay, so even though there is discrepancies, there's differences in how people socially categorized or socially perceived Barack Obama as a function of social group membership, but there seemed to be pretty much uh, general un unanimous consensus <laughs> about was their answer to this question. Would Obama's race impact your vote? So regardless of whether people were favorably inclined to Obama or McCain uh, before the election, over 80% of both groups said race doesn't matter here. Race is of no consequence in my decision about who I'm going to vote for, to which we said, really? So this is, this is what was happening in 2007, 2008 that inspired our interest uh, in this line of work. Um, and, and that really sort of precedes the, the data that I'm gonna share with you today. One of the big questions that we were asking is how do individuals perceive minority candidates and does it matter? And of course, what I've been talking about so far is social categorization. Do they identify Barack Obama as a member of a majority or minority group? Um, and to what extent do they do that? And, and I am gonna talk about that to some extent, but I'm gonna push this a little bit more into visual representation. So social perception, how we see people in our minds, not just the labels that we put on them or how we socially categorize them, but that mental image that comes to mind about individuals and about minorities in particular in their aspirations to lead. Now, at a few points in this talk, I wanna interject um, with some moments of truth because I feel like as a graduate student, um, I always had these questions of like, how did this body of work come to be? How did, how did this happen? Because colloquium, not necessarily this one, but all the ones that I've seen are like so impressive, right? They stitch together all these bodies of work over so many years. And I'm just always left in awe about how it really happened. And nobody really talks about that enough. So, it, you know, unless it's in the lab that you're a part of or those people that you have close connections with, it's kind of, you don't get to see how the sausage is made. So I wanna offer some moments of truth. And here's one right now, which is that this whole line of work actually it didn't start with all this lofty stuff that I'm talking about. It was important and it is relevant to the development of our ideas, but that's not really where it started. All of this started with trying to understand how people perceive the size of cookies. 
we were interested in, in motivations that affect, affect health decisions, and we are really inspired by the work that Ken Fujita does. And so we also wanted to figure out if we could understand who engages in self-control and doesn't eat the cookie and, and who, who can't and who eats that cookie and is somehow their representation of cookies involved in that self-control failure. But we're not as good of scientists as Ken Fujita in his lab is, and we just could never really make sense of it. We never got solid data that made us feel confident that we understood how mental representations of cookies affect eating. And so we were like, you know what, we need something that's like more predictable and maybe even like easier to study than what Ken and company are studying. So we turned to studying racism. Racism in America is far more predictable than the size of cookies in people's minds. I am disappointed to say, but really that was the point. We were trying to understand mental representations of cookies and we struggled with that and our data just, just never gave us great insight into that. And so then we turned to understanding how people perceive or mentally represent members of minority groups. And that's something that we could consistently get a, a great deal of traction on. And so we pivoted from cookies to this line of work that I'll share with you today. Okay, so one of the first questions that we asked, um, well, one of the first <laughs> studies that I'll present to you today, asked our participants one week before the 2008 election, um, what they thought, how they mentally represented the candidates. So we told them that photographs can differ in how well they represent a politician and capture his or her, tr his or her true essence. So how much does this photograph that I'm about to show you represent, how well does it represent this candidate? So you can sort of play along in your own mind, one to seven scale, how well does this photo represent Barack Obama? How well does this photo represent Barack Obama? How well does this photo represent Barack Obama? Okay, so that's what our participants experienced in, in some sense. We got those responses from them and then we followed up with them the day after the election. We called them and we asked them, who did you vote for? So what we found was that some people a week before the election gave the highest ratings to these pictures. They said, these are the pictures that best represent what Barack Obama really looks like. Now among this subset of the data, those people that thought these best reflected Barack Obama, 75% of them told us a week, the day after the election that they cast their vote for Barack Obama. But other participants said these photos best represented what Barack Obama really looks like. Of this subset of pictures, of this subset of participants, 89% voted for John McCain. Okay, so and if you forget what John McCain looked like, he looks like this, right? So what this meant to us was that the mental representations that people had of this minority candidate um, bore a relationship with who they actually cast their ballot for. And of course, you can see it on this slide here of what we had manipulated from one picture or what's the difference between the top and the bottom set its skin tone, but our participants didn't realize that what we had actually done was artificially manipulate whether what that photo had been lightened or darkened or kept as it originally was. So you may not have noticed it as I was presenting them sequentially upon your screen, because what probably stood out to you is that his clothes are changing, the formality of his pose is changing, whether it's sort of candid or staged. Um, posture. And that's what our participants picked up on as well. But of course, in a fully counterbalanced design, we took each of those pictures and either kept them in his original skin tone or lightened or darkened them, and then presented one of those skin tone variations to each of our participants, but crossed with which particular picture um, had presented him as lightened or darkened. And so statistically, then we know that people are responding to these changes in skin tone over and above any particular element of his clothing or his, his posture. So again, what this meant to us is that, you know, those that were favorably inclined and in fact did support his aspirations to lead our country were those people that also had mentally represented him as in fact lighter than his actual skin tone. And that those people who had a mental representation as, of him as darker than he really was, those people weren't favorably inclined and in fact did not vote for him. They voted for the other guy in this election. So this opened up a big question then for us of, well then if there's something that's like, that's so important to me, this meant that there's something important about those mental representations of what's that image that comes to mind as they think about this candidate. Well, then what predicts those perceptual representations? What's giving rise to these differences in, in how people are mentally um, construing and constructing their image of what he looks like? So, so that's that was our next descriptive question that we set out to, to answer here. And of 
course, one of the first things that came to our mind was political ideology, that there's probably something that's tied to ideology that might be shaping the way that they come up, that they envision um, this particular candidate and others. And, and maybe it's ideology that's shaping those uh, mental representations. And, and, and so let's study that. So of course we ask our participants how they identify and, and then we had them go through the same sort of uh, photo rating um, exercise that you just saw. They, gave, they saw three photos, they gave each photo a rating, and then we did some math to try to come up with this index. We analyzed these data a few different ways, and you can see that in the paper. Um, but this is, this is one metric that we, that we used to sort of coagulate or, or combine the three different ratings that they got. Basically, a, a higher score, a positive score, means that the representation of this person is, is lighter, um, of, 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 uh, yeah, is lighter than, than darker. Okay, so what we found um, is some of this supports what we thought. We went into this with the intuition that, oh, it's conservatives, conservative Americans are the ones that are representing him as darker in skin tone, that they're gonna have like the, the wrong idea of what he really looks like. And that's leading to these, um, that's leading to these differences in representation and then their voting decisions. And we were right about that, that conservative Americans did represent him as darker than he really is. The negative score means a higher value given to the dark rather than lightened version. But liberals were doing that too. Our liberal participants had like the wrong uh, mental representation of him. Uh, and that's, so that's something that our own bias in, not, in our thinking um, uh, found it went against what we had thought would, would happen. But most importantly, what we found is that this light advantage score um, predicted a vote cast for Barack Obama. So again, the more that they had represented him as lighter in skin tone, uh, the, the, more, uh, the higher the odds that they actually cast a vote for him. Of course, this is a correlational study, right? And so there's just a lot that's, that's going on in here. There's far more than just political ideology that's gonna shape their representations. Um, and so we followed this up with experimental manipulations of, of these same ideas as well. So in this context, in another study, the experimental version um, of these ideas, we presented participants with a candidate aspiring, uh, um, aspiring to lead a major, the US Department of Education. So a federal, a, a branch of the federal government that is of consequence to us all, whether you have kids or not, what happens to our educational system in America is important and this guy wants to lead it. Now our participants didn't know who this is. It's a, it's a fictional political candidate. Um, if there were some Canadians in the grad student body that I got to meet today. So maybe you recognize this is actually Jerome McGinley, a Canadian hockey player, but no American actually knows that. So this was just a total stranger in our participants' minds. So we give a picture of him, of Harvey Ryder. We talk about his background and his preparations to lead the Department of Education. Then next, we ask participants themselves, what are their beliefs about six different issues facing the educational system? What's your position on these issues? Like having year round school versus the typical school year that, that we have in the United States. Are you for it or are you against year round school? So they did, they re reported their uh, positions to six different issues and then we give them fake feedback. Um, so for some participants, they were randomly assigned to receive this feedback that the candidate agreed with them on five out of six issues, or that the candidate um, agreed with them on only one of these six issues. Okay, so this is sort of trying to do a mock up of what we had um, just had as self reported data in the first study. So these the support category is like, you know, liberals looking at um, Barack Obama, and this would be um, uh, conservatives looking at Barack Obama. We're trying to experimentally create that experience that we had measured through self-report in our first study. Then they went through the same thing, um, uh, same task as you saw before, and sequentially, not simultaneously as you see it here. They see three different photographs of Harvey Ryder, who they had just seen and just learned about, and they report how representative this each of these photographs are in sequence um, of, of how this uh, how this candidate really looks. And what we found, like before, is that those participants who had been experimentally uh, assigned to feel like they shared his, his political group identity represented him as lighter in skin tone. Their mental image of Harvey Ryder that they had just met about, uh, just learned about, was lighter than, than those people who had uh, felt that they did not share his same political group membership. 
So just knowing whether you are sort of in somebody in the same camp or not in somebody's camp is changing how people are are mentally representing this image of this person in both a correlational and an experimental sense. Um, okay. Then importantly, of course, we want to know are there consequences of these shifts in mental representation that we've that we measured. And in fact, there are. So again, this, this index of the mental representation of this person's skin tone predicted their intentions to support his aspirations uh, to lead. So across these studies, then um, we, you know, we found this evidence that that um, you know a shared sense of identity is shifting people's mental mental representations of of these minority candidates, and that there were consequences. There were real consequences, both in terms of their support uh, and actual voting decisions for Barack Obama, also their intentions to support him, and for this candidate that they were just learning about now. Um, so a question that has that has come up at the, and this is a good point to ask, were these photographs evaluated for attractiveness and photo quality? Um, no, the Barack Obama ones were, were ugh, I can't remember, to be honest. Um, I can't remember in that, in that study, but it, uh, regardless of the answer, because we had, there is no confound between which photos were lightened or darkened or kept original, um, even even if there are differences in attractiveness of the photo, it wouldn't account for for these data. That statistically, you know, there are picture effects. Like he he just looks happier in some of these pictures. Barack Obama did, or he looks stronger, right? And of course that matters. So we found we found picture specific effects, but this effect of skin tone is above and beyond those picture specific effects that you're referencing. And in the studies that I'm getting to, Mark, we do um, we do we do take this into account. How professionally composed is the photograph? How easy is it to read the person's emotions as we alter skin tone, uh, um, sort of responding to Kerry Kawakami's work? And there are these differences, but again, we can either adjust for that statistically, or it's over and above these picture-specific effects that we are showing the relationship between skin tone and consequences. Um, okay, so Nick is asking, I'm sorry if I missed it, but were these white people? Um, and you are right, Nick, to ask that question because they didn't tell you. <laughs> so in this first paper, um, we just we just let it be whoever wanted to participate in these studies. And um, these results got some attention and people asked that question of like, well, well, like this must like this just must be white people, right? And no, it's not just white people. Um, it's not just white people in this study. And so we started to like post hoc decompose our data to see if we could get a sense of how are people of different races responding to um, to these experiences, and, and is this a white person effect? And we knew we were underpowered to look for that. So this is the next line of work then, is being intentionally powered enough to explore this. And so, like Nick, we asked. Well, do black voters do the same thing? So this really inspired our, our next line of work. Nick's, Nick's questions uh, inspired our next line of work. I'll um, again, a weird sense of time, I guess. <laughs> like Nick, you inspired it like, like eight years ago or something. Um, but we wondered the same thing as you. Um, uh, Emily, okay. uh, yeah. Emily, but before you get to that, um, yeah. just a question about an alternative experiment. So, so let's say, instead of Barack Obama being pictured lighter or darker, in some photos he had a pretty flower on his lapel and in other photos he had an ugly flower on his lapel. And the people who ended up voting for him ended up saying, oh, the ones with the pretty flower are how I picture Obama. That, that, that's how he looks to me. And the ones who saw him with an ugly flower and said, that's what he's like, they, they voted for the alternative candidate. Would that be similar to what you're doing or would that be very different? Um, I don't know. I haven't done the flower study, but I think, yeah, I think it's actually has some similarity here because at the end of the day, you're just saying like, um, does he look, oh, you're, I'm trying to get well, at this, well, just like people, a general prefer, association. We know both white and black individuals prefer light skin over dark skin, yeah. right? So that's a, that's a positive thing. So if you see a positive thing, then you're more likely to, uh, like a pretty flower is better than an ugly flower. And so if you see Obama, and that's how he looks, the pretty flower, that, that then is an indicator that you like him. Yeah. And if it's an indicator that you like him because you see him with the 
likable skin color or the likable flower or anything in the picture that's likable, that's how I see him, that's going to predict that I'll vote for him or choose him because I like him. Yes, and I and I agree with you that that is part of what is going on here. And in fact, I will I will get to that. I will show data that supports that idea that there is just there are just these cognitive associations between like what's what's good and light, and that that does feed into representations of skin tone. Uh, I'll show you an analysis of archival of an archival analysis of what the media does to skin tone to try to convey those associations. So you're you're totally right. In this case, though, you know, we don't have flowers, we have skin tone. And, and so these, that basic association that you're talking about, I actually do think is what is driving this. When you think well of somebody because you, you have the same political beliefs or you already know that you're going to vote for them, like how what happens with that representation? Will you represent them in all ways as in more in, in all facets in more positive ways? And that could be like mentally putting a pretty flower on his lapel or in this case, changing his skin tone in your mind. So I. I actually do, I agree with you, is what I have to say. <laughs> we hadn't done that that flower study, but I, I bet you it would probably work. Um, okay, so what do black voters do? Um, so we we used another, um, we used the same techniques that I've talked to you about before, uh, already, but also a, a new technique to sort of get at this idea of representation and uh, consequences for intentions to support. So in this case, we were looking at people's support for pe for individuals who wanted to be the director of the Department of Agriculture. This is like the FDA who regulates food safety. Um, and they what they saw were these three candidates. They, they saw all of them at the same time. We introduced them to Carl, Patrick, and Michael, of course, counterbalanced. Um, at the same time, they read bios of each of these people that present them as you know, equally qualified, although differentially qualified to run the Department of Agriculture. Of course, those bios were counterbalanced or randomized to correspond to names that corresponded to pictures. Um, and as you can see, and as our participants could see at that same moment, just like you, that some people are darker and some people are lighter, even though they are all members of, of a black uh, minority group, they all self-identify as black. And then we ask them, now we are, we are manipulating what we think is this process, right? We think that uh, we think that mental representations shift and that a shift in mental representations of skin tone predict support, relate to support. So now we're manipulating that. We've manipulated what we think is happening in people's minds. And we want to see, does that manipulation of the process uh, relate to the outcome for, for support? How likely would you be to vote for this candidate? So what we found in this study is are similar to the results that I've shared with you already, is that our white participants indicate a stronger likelihood of supporting or voting for the lightened rather than the darkened candidate. Okay, so these resonate, these, share, these data share similarities with what you've already seen in this presentation. But of course, the question is, well, what do our black participants do? If they aren't part of the white, the white majority group, what are they doing? Do they, do they share or do they show something that's different? And we went into this study like postulating both possibilities. Maybe they look like white people because there's just strong associations between lightness and leadership and lightness and good, the, the valence goodness. Uh, especially in America, and maybe you know if there's an awareness of that, or that's that's those associations are accessible, then Black people should do the same thing. But what a crappy world that would be if Black if Black voters, Black Americans, are doing the same thing as Americans and having um, stronger support for the less prototypical, more lighter skinned looking member of even their own racial group. So what we found was that for our Black participants, they showed a similar pattern that they had greater support for the lightened rather than the darkened candidate. Okay, now I had said there'll be a few moments of truth in here. We had piloted these, these, these studies before running this full study that I've told you about. So here's a little bit of a moment of truth. When we were running these studies, I, I really couldn't make sense of this. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story. I'm gonna tell you a theory. I'm gonna tell you the theory now and I'll show you the data to, to support it. But I didn't, I didn't go in like predicting that this is what's gonna happen. I was really caught off guard from by these data because we approached this line of work of like, do black voters do the same thing as the white voters? Like really not knowing what was gonna happen. And I couldn't come up with a theory that would help make sense of those data from the black voters that I just shared with you. And I went to many conferences and asked all of my, my smartest of friends, like what is happening in here? Why, why are black voters, why are black participants doing something that, that really is 
not aligned with with any like model of motivation <laughs> that that I'm familiar with. So I couldn't explain these data for a long time, and um, like a couple like two years, I I didn't understand what was happening. And then uh, I talked with a graduate student uh, about these data. He's a first year PhD student and, and he had some insights and he was right. So all of this, all of the credit for what I'm about to share with you uh, goes to Chadley Stern who, who realized what's going on. And now an important caveat is um, that when that, you know, the first line of work that you saw, we did around the time of the 2008 election right? So there's a lot going on. 2008 election, we're seeing a change of presidency, but we're also seeing like the first possibly non-white person who's going to ascend to presidency. So this was a really uncertain time, right? In, in, in the history of America. And then when we asked this question, like Nick did, um, of what happens when you ask non-white people, put non-white people in these scenarios, we asked that after the election, because that only dawned on us after the election when things had stabilized. And this graduate student realized, you're, there's a history effect here. You know, Think back to like basic research methods, the timing of when you ran these studies, I think really matters. And in fact, I think if you start modeling that, then you're going to be able to make sense of all these data that you can't understand. And who's right. So this pattern that I showed you that looked like black voters are doing the same thing as white voters or our black participants are doing the same thing as our white participants. This pattern emerged during times of system instability. When our American, our, when, the, when our society is in, in disarray, like around the time of elections. So there was another manipulation that I hadn't told you about within this particular study that I've just shared with you. We manipulated what's going on in the Department of Agriculture, this department that these candidates are aspiring to lead right now. So for half of the participants that they learned that there has been mismanagement within the Department of Agriculture, that the uh, that the Department of Agriculture has seen some turmoil, things are highly unstable. And so that's the context that people have in mind as they're considering, well, who should lead this department? But for other participants, for other participants, we induced, we, in, we induced a social context of stability. So we swapped out some of these words and, uh, and, and made them feel that everything is just sort of running status quo, running well status quo. Things are highly stable, there's increased order, um, things are quite predictable. And so those were the two manipulations, instability versus stability. That was a layer added on to the experimental design here. And we thought, the Chadley Stern thought that this was going to be particularly important for making sense of how of, of, of black voters decisions in particular. And he was right. So what we found was that for our white participants, it didn't matter whether we had induced a feeling that the Department of Agriculture was stable or unstable. There was no effect of that stability manipulation for the white participants. This is just this. This is literally the graph that you saw before because there is no moderation by uh, system stability for our white participants. And this is the same graph you saw before for the black participants. Again, under conditions of instability. But when you tell them, when you tell participants that, and black participants in particular, that the Department of Agriculture is highly predictable and stable, you see a complete reversal. So now they show greater support for the darkened rather than the lightened uh, candidate. We see a complete reversal here. Now, let me just say a couple things um, is that we replicated these patterns of results several times. So under conditions of stability, some of those first data I showed you, we replicated those patterns twice in two different studies. And then when we, when we intentionally manipulated stability for that three-way interaction that I've just unpacked for you. We replicated that two additional times. So we feel pretty confident in these patterns of effects that we're sharing with you right now. So then the big question is why? Like why? Why? What is happening here um, that is leading white people to not be responsive to the stability or instability of, of the of this of the government? And why do these patterns of support differ for our black participants? At the end of the day, I'm a motivated social cognition researcher. So my mind went to understanding the motivations. What are the motivations that are changing under these different social conditions? When we're talking about stability and instability, those are the social conditions that, that people have in mind that they may be experiencing, or at least that we've activated. And we think that different motivations get prioritized under conditions of instability 
than under conditions of stability. And that's what we set out to unpack also in, in this line of work. So under conditions of instability, what we think is that people start prioritizing what's accessible, what's important to them is the motivation to defend the status quo. So during times of uncertainty, during times of chaos, like election times, that's scary, right? That induces some uncertainty and fear that um, and unpredictability that people can be uncomfortable with. And, and people start resorting back to feeling a sense of comfort in the system that they already know. Even people that don't benefit from it, including Black Americans. Black Americans are not benefited by the status quo in America right now, but, but at least it's a system that, that one is aware of, having, of how to navigate, right? So because of the sense of uncertainty and fear that it can be experienced when chaos disorder uh, surrounds us, Oftentimes people revert back to saying, to saying like, okay, let's just go back to what we know. Let's defend the status quo because that will provide a sense of, of comfort and predictability that I need right now. So we measured this um, prioritization of the, stat of, of the defensive status quo um, by using this scale, um, asking people to respond to these items. In general, the American political system operates as it should. Right? This would be reifying the status quo. Society is fair, reifying the status quo. And so we, we took this measure from Aaron Kay and John Jost. And so that's what we think is important in prioritizing people's minds during uh, times of instability, social contexts of instability. In contrast, we think a different motivation is prioritized under conditions of stability. So now we think that under conditions of stability, people are prioritizing what's, what's important to them to, uh, to, to think about and to act upon is their motivation to enhance one's own group. So we used, we, we used a scale to assess this. What is their motivation? How motivated are they to enhance their own group by asking things like, it's probably a good thing that certain groups are at the top and others are at the bottom. Um, sometimes it's necessary to step on other groups. This is a scale um, that has been shown to, to represent or to capture people's interest in enhancing the status of their own group. Now, importantly, we think that these two different social conditions lead to this differential prioritization of motivations for everybody, right? It's not just that white people are motivated to defend the status quo and black people want to enhance the status of their own group. No, we think both of these motivations are important for both black and white people. And we think that these social conditions for black and white people shift which one of these two goals is active right now, which one are they thinking about? It's just that for black and white people, these motives play out in different ways. So for white participants, the motive the enhancing the status of my own group and defending the status quo lead to the same outcome, which means supporting people of people of my same groups uh, ascension to leadership, supporting a more lighter skinned leadership. So regardless of whether I'm thinking about defending the status quo or enhancing my group, I'm gonna be interested in promoting lighter leadership if I'm a white person. But for black people, they play out in different ways. These are competing motivations. They, they would have differential effects. So defending the status quo, uh, during times of instability would also, like white people, lead to support of lighter skinned, traditional looking leaders. Under stability though, the motivation to enhance one's own group is going to lead to a different outcome. That would be supporting darker skinned, more prototypical looking minority leaders. I'll take a moment to pause here. Does that, does that thinking make sense about what the social context should do to the motivations? the prioritization of the motivations and how that might differentially affect outcomes for black and white voters. Feel free to unmute if there's a question at this point. Emily, I don't yeah. have an objection to what you're proposing. I guess I'm a little bit, a little surprised though that you posit that uh, under conditions of stability uh, that I would want to prioritize my own group as opposed to like promote I don't know, a more collective identity or to get along or something. I guess, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about like realistic conflict theory and it's when it's when things are scarce resources and then we have to fight for every penny that that's when group enhancement motivations come to the forefront. And I know stability is not quite the same thing, but 
there's sort of an element of stability issues. Is there not when you're having high intergroup conflict? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I also could have made a different prediction. This project is led by Chadley Stern. And so these are his predictions having come from a John Jost um, philosophical background. But I was surprised, you'll see the data in a second, and, and it's possible to test these these competing alternatives with the data that I'm going to share with you. But I also thought another there's another possibility, which is during times of instability, that means there's an opportunity for change. And shouldn't the people who would want change be the, the ones who then are interested in enhancing the status of their own group, which is what you're saying too. I'm just, I don't know, just I'm saying it in words that resonate with my brain, which is when there's an opportunity for change, isn't that when you want change to happen? And who wants change to happen more than the people who aren't benefiting from the status quo? Um, so that is a possibility. That was a possibility in my mind as well. So again, what we're, does, does that mean? Yeah, so I, I agree with you, Ken, that, that, like, that was a possibility. But these data suggest that that isn't what is happening. Um, within these samples, right? That, I mean, there might be a minority of people who feel that same way, but the majority of people that we're going to model here don't see instability as an opportunity to enhance the status of their own group or to promote their own group. Okay, so let me show you the data here then. Um, what you'll see on the X axis is their preference for a, a lighter skinned candidate versus a darker skinned candidate on, that was the Y axis, I, maybe I said the wrong thing, obviously you know. On the x-axis is their motivation to defend um, the status quo. Um, okay, and so what we see here is that under conditions of instability, we see that those with a stronger motivation to defend the status quo are preferring the lighter skinned candidate compared to those who, are, who aren't concerned with um, the defending the status quo. And that happens under conditions of instability. We see this big predictive effect of their general motivation to varying extents uh, uh, to defend the status quo. But during conditions of stability, we don't see that effect. So how we interpret these data then is that what's salient, what's active in people's minds is that status quo defense motivation under conditions of instability, but that, that motivation to defend the status quo is not having a predictive effect on who they choose to support um, during conditions of stability. So, so this line here goes against that, um, that, I, that idea that, um, that people would be interested in, in like changing up the system when there is an opportunity to do that. Uh, and importantly, what we see is that this pattern is there for both black and white voters, right? This pattern is not moderated by participant race. And that's what we thought would happen is that uh, that for both black and white people, what is what they're thinking about during conditions of instability is is how interested are they in supporting the status quo, um, and and so this line is there for both black and and white voters, but under conditions of stability, we thought a different motive is prioritized that the group enhancement motive is prioritized and that should lead to different outcomes for both our black and white voters. So under conditions of system stability, what we see here on the X axis are, is uh, the motivation to enhance their own group. We see that white voters who are strongly motivated to enhance the status of their group uh, prefer the lighter candidate and black voters who are strongly motivated to enhance the status of their own group have a strong preference for the darker skinned candidates. So again, during conditions of stability, social conditions of stability, we see that now what's active in people's minds is this group enhancement motivation. And it leads to different outcomes for who black and white voters want to support, who, who they are pushing up or elevating into these leadership positions. And importantly, this effect of group enhancement is not there under conditions of instability. So this tells us that the social conditions are changing which motive is important to people, which motive is accessible to them, and that at least during conditions of stability, it's having differential effects on what, what a leader looks like in their mind and who they are supporting. This is a good moment to pause. This is sort of, this is a lot to process here in this moment, and, and I'm gonna move on to like our next question. Um, that we asked. And as you're thinking about maybe what you, what you want to interject with, let me just, uh, yeah, okay, I will stop. I did say here's a chance to talk. <laughs> it, 
Emily, I, I yeah. have a quick question. Sure. Um, so I, I buy all of this having been on uh, uh, John's dissertation committee. I, I figured <laughs> you were kind of going in this direction when you talked about stability and instability. Um, I, what I'm curious about here, I wonder if it's important that you had um, perhaps all candidates that would have been identified as the same group, but varying in prototypicality based on, on uh based on, on skin tone, um, as opposed to if you had uh, candidates that actually were in different categories, would that have gotten rid of this? Or, you know, because it seems like this part of the story really requires that, that there's some kind of link to group. Um, I think so. Yeah. So you're right that we don't have we don't have white. We don't have the majority or, or the prototypical leader represented in this study as, as a target. Um, and we we thought through that, and the and our thinking I think resonates with yours is that well people will vote for the white person then for for many reasons, and it and it we might still be able to test these effects of social conditions, shifting motives to change people, differentially change people's support. Um, but all of that might get swamped by just an overall preference for the prototypical leader, which is a white male. So I, I share I share your concern. Um, uh, and let me just say, I'm not gonna fully resolve that concern with this next line of work, but at least it adds another layer here, which is uh, an issue that you brought up, which is the shared shared group identity that that is important here um so yeah so so that is what i will talk about next is adding a little bit of that element um okay so emily, these emily can yeah, i yeah. jump in with a question i yeah. wonder if the nature of the instability may really matter um and i could see defense of the status quo being a motive if you think the instability it, the best you could hope for is the status quo um, in that nature of the instability. I wonder if the motive might be totally different if the instability could be something that's better than it is now um, for your group in question. Um, to fit the status quo, and that's the best you can hope for. Um, but if you can imagine positive change, like let's say moment now where you have potentially Black Lives Matter and a better society with less racism, less systemic racism, maybe the motive would be different. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, I think your studies don't potentially address. Um, is that, and for me, defending the status quo, well, that's the best possible, makes sense. But really the motive is, what's the best outcome in this instability I can imagine? If that's a status quo, then you defend the status quo. If it's something else, then the motive would be elsewhere. Yeah, that's a really good point, Steve. Thank, thanks for bringing that up. And we haven't we haven't addressed that. We haven't um, we haven't even thought about that. <laughs> so I guess all of these data um, probably sort of require negativity dominance, which we all know on this call is is a thing. Um, and that probably what people are worried about, what's dominating is that it might not be better, right? The, the future might not be better than what we know it to be now. Um, and so, and that's what's driving this concern and, and leading to this preference for the status quo during times of instability. But like you're bringing up now, there is a chance for real change to happen uh, in today's contemporary society, right? So that might bring a hopefulness that perhaps an, under other social conditions isn't there as people are thinking about instability. Um, all of which is to say, really great point, and yeah, we haven't we haven't thought about that, but thank you. So we okay. So how we sort of summarize, well, how I summarize these these data in my mind was with a real um, disillusionment for the future and and sadness, honestly, because to me, like I've already sort of foreshadowed that when there's an opportunity for change. Yeah, maybe some people are, are are grasping that opportunity for change if instability does in fact mean an opportunity for change for the better. But at least the majority of our participants here are not and they're gravitating towards reifying the status quo. So how would we ever diversify leadership then? How do we ever change up the system if when there's an opportunity to change the system, people, people aren't inclined to do that. That's not what is most accessible in driving 
and driving their decisions. So how, like, this is a self-perpetuating cycle then, that how do we ever get out of it? And that made me really sad um, that, that that could be one implication of these data. Um, and so then, as descriptively as any stage of this project has unfolded, I thought, well, I don't have the answer, but you know, maybe maybe there is sort of a post-Obama uh, movement. Maybe there's a shift. I'm old, and I've seen a lot of prototypical-looking leaders, but like, you know, teenagers, adolescents, they actually they're probably the only president that they're really cognizant of except for Trump is Barack Obama. So they grew up with, with a more diverse, at least this uh, leader of our country. And, and maybe there is a difference, maybe just with time. Maybe we can't shift these local social conditions right now to affect local motivations, but maybe with time society is gonna shift. So that was the thinking that just then uh, in this line of work led me to ask, well, how do kids see leadership? If we take the same paradigm and just test it, um, with a different age group would be fine, the same effects. And of course there's reasons to think yes, because of just how ingrained these stereotypes uh, are in society and how easy it is to pick up on what's a prototype and what's not a prototype and that we know babies can do that. So maybe there's no hope and kids will do the same thing as adults. Or maybe if this all comes down to motivations and, and some kind of exposure, maybe they'll do something that's different. So, uh, so I just opened this line of work that we're currently doing now with this question in mind. So one of our first forays into approaching this question was to work with a bunch of schools in New York City that were predominantly Hisp Hispanic and black um, serving schools in some of the most sort of underfunded, challenging, um, underserved neighborhoods uh, in, in New York City. And we put them through a similar kind of survey experience as what you've seen so far, but with a few more elements. So we also made these questions be appropriate to kids. So we asked in some pre-testing, um, what are the most important and high, well, we used other words, important high status prestigious jobs in America? Who's got the best jobs that have the most power to do anything? And, and the jobs you see on the screen here, what middle schoolers think are the most important, most influential jobs being on television, um, being a coach. <laughs> these are the most important high status jobs for them. And we asked them in an age appropriate way, um, uh, could this person that you're about to see have these jobs, each of these eight different jobs? And we asked each of our participants to make multiple ratings. So they saw Black, Southeast Asian, East Asian, and Hispanic targets, men and women. Uh, and so they saw all of these targets represented and made ratings about each of these targets. But between subjects, we manipulated how this particular target appeared to them. Was this person lighter or original or darker, darker skinned? We had Photoshopped them in a between subjects kind of way. And so we just wanted to know um, who do kids give these the highest leadership potential ratings to? Is it like adults where the lighter the skin tone, the higher the perceived leadership potential? Uh, and what we found was that the answer was no, that these middle schoolers, again, predominantly black and Hispanic children, um, middle schoolers gave the highest leadership ratings to the darker rather than the lighter, lighter skin toned targets. There's many moderators here though that are really fascinating to think through. So this line that you see here uh, are, are for those participants that were strong in the motivation to enhance their own group. So we asked them kid appropriate um, questions. Um, we asked them to identify like, well, which, what are the labels that you would use to describe yourself? And they, through lots of different words, told us they identify as black or they identify as Hispanic or however they identify. And then they answered these questions. I think that being part of my cultural group, being black has a, I, I think that there's a lot to be proud of. I feel committed to my cultural group, group which we had identified as being black or Hispanic or however they self-identified. So these are, um, these are the parts, um, so this is how we measured kids' uh, motivation to enhance their own group. But among those kids that were weak in their motivation to enhance their own group, we see that there is no effect of skin tone on who they give the strongest leadership ratings to. So like for adults, the motivation to enhance your own group uh, among these minority adolescents predicted their support for the darker skinned targets. Importantly though, this pattern only emerged for targets from the children's own racial group. So this pattern is there for black, black adolescents 
thinking about rating black targets, Hispanic adolescents rating Hispanic targets or biracial black Hispanic children rating both black and Hispanic targets. But when you look at their ratings of targets that are from a, a racial group that they don't identify with, you see that group enhancement motivation doesn't bear any effect. It isn't predicting um, who they ascribe the greatest leadership potential to. So we had in our mind that like, of course, you know, it might, there might be an exposure effect that these kids are in neighborhoods where their community leaders, their school teachers, their principals are in fact minorities. And so maybe, you know, a higher rating for the darker rather than lighter skinned targets just represents exposure and what they see in their own environments. But all of these moderators suggest that that exposure effect probably isn't what's happening here, right? Because we see that it is driven by um, shared group identity and these personal motivations that they have that vary, of course, from one individual to another housed within even the same school growing up even in the same community. So it doesn't seem to be an, an, a pattern of results that can be explained just by simply um, what it is, who they, who they see in their own worlds as being the most effective leaders. Um, Okay, so then we replicated this uh, study with now a group of high school students um, from, from several different schools, different high schools in New York City, using the same techniques, the same sort of survey approach that I shared with you about the middle school students. This, in this case, though, we used jobs that high school students think are the most important and prestigious. Now, being on TV isn't enough to be a, a leader. You have to be an astronaut or a Hollywood film director. So these are the jobs high schoolers think are the most important and prestigious, and they indicated on a seven-point Likert scale that was that was marked or indexed by different percentages the likelihood that this person would have each of these jobs. And like before, they rated men and women from uh, multiple racial and ethnic minority groups, and between subjects we varied whether that particular target had lightened, darkened, or medium skin tone. And what we found was the same uh, interaction effect that I shared with you before, that the high school students who had a strong motivation to enhance their own group were rating um, the darker rather than lighter skinned tone targets as having greater leadership potential. And that effect was not there among those high schoolers that had a weak motivation to enhance their own racial group. Some moderators here that were interesting um, is that this pattern emerged for Hispanic targets, Hispanic students, I'm sorry, that were rating targets from their same racial group. Hispanic targets. But when you look at what do Hispanic students say about targets that are from a different racial group, that same pattern of moderation, that this isn't something that's reflecting exposure in their environment um, because, uh, sorry, because of this, this effective group enhancement that was there before, but it isn't just to carry over that anybody who's darker skinned has greater leadership potential. It's only Hispanic students rating Hispanic targets. Now, what about our black students? The black students show something that's different by high school compared to the middle schoolers. So what we see is that there is no effect of the group enhancement motivation for our black students when they're rating black targets, right? So this is a pattern that was that we hadn't seen before, that was unexpected. What we had hoped, what we had anticipated was that this green line would go up, would be a positive association that, that Black students who are strong, who feel strong in their motivation to enhance their own group would say that the darker rather than the lighter skinned targets have the greatest leadership potential. That's what we saw with our middle schoolers. But by the time, by, by, by in high school though, our black students have, and we saw that with the Hispanic target, Hispanic students in high school, but our black students aren't showing that same effect. So we were perplexed. We are perplexed by this, this effect. Why, why don't we see the support for more prototypical leadership emerging, even among those black students who are proud to be black, who are looking at black targets, why don't they think prototypical people, looking people can actually be the ones that lead across all these different facets of society? So we started to probe the data a little bit more so to see if we could get some sort of traction on, on this green line. What's happening with this green line? And what we found was that our predicted effect, where Black students who are motivated to support other Black people, who have a strong group enhancement motivation, who are looking at other Black targets, show a stronger support for dark or prototypical looking Black um, candidates rather than lighter candidates. That does emerge only when they're in schools that have more Black teachers. So, 
because we have multiple schools that are represented in this data set, we could probe that school level effect. We could start to decompose our data and say, well, do we see this predicted pattern that we saw with Hispanic students? So we see it with black students where those that are proud to be black and, and motivated to enhance the status of their own group support the aspirations of prototypical looking leaders, uh, black leaders, well, we find that effect if black students are in schools where, where there are more black teachers. And in fact, this pattern is completely reversed among black students who are in schools with fewer black teachers. So what looked like a flat line, what was a flat line in that um, interaction effect that I unpacked for you is really the result of two competing effects that we see black students supporting prototypical black leaders so long as they're in, entrenched in a school environment where they see other black teachers, black leaders. And black students say that prototypical looking dark skinned black people have even lower odds of leading in all facets of society when they are embedded in schools that have very few black teachers. So this was this, this made sense within with when you're looking at well what's happening in society what's happening in New York City even right now there was a big study of course done uh, by the Brookings Institute um, that was investigating um, the effect of, of racial composition of teachers within schools and the impact that's having on educational outcomes um, for minority students and one of the big takeaways here is that it has that representation, minority representation is really important for minority students' success. And it's having a really big impact on black students in particular because black teachers have the highest attrition rate um, in, in schools. And this is particularly the case in, in New York City. Um, this issue is a big issue in New York City, especially because New York City has the most racially segregated public school system in all of the United States. This is an issue that everybody in New York City is grappling with that de Blasio is, is our mayor is is working on uh, because it because everybody understands the impact that representation is having, particularly on minority students educational outcomes. And what these data suggest to us then is um, that not only is it affecting engagement or test performance scores like these studies have found, but it's also affecting in a profound way their beliefs on who can be a leader and can people that are of my same group lead and can prototypical looking people be leaders. Teacher representation seems to be having a big impact um, on black students in particular. Here's a good place to pause. Any reactions to this, comments? So Molly, do you think um, having more black teachers is an indication of the way the school operates or a proxy for that? Or do you think the actual number of teachers is what matters? Uh, I don't know, Steve. I'm sure you have lots of thoughts on that. The only other thing that I'm not going to sh show data on here is that we're also finding that the uh, economic segregation index, uh, the economic inequality within a school also matters. Of course, these all co-vary and are confounded by lots of things like how a school runs, how it operates, what neighborhood it's in, what kind of funding it has, how much are parents involved. All of these things are comorbid with this issue of teacher representation. So I don't have a good handle on it. I didn't have a good handle on why are Black and Hispanic high school students reacting in such different ways. And this is our first step to trying to unpack or better understand that. Why do Black students and not Hispanic students seem to lose this sort of hopeful, what seemed like the hopeful pattern of results that, that diverse leadership is possible? So I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm sure the answer is yes, that there is something that's different about what's happening in these schools that have higher rather than lower uh, representation. Um, I am mindful of the time. Um, uh, let me just, I'm gonna give you a quick summary of some of the other data that I wanted to share with you. Other thoughts we had is like, you know, maybe it has something to do, you know, maybe this belief about um, leadership and can prototypical minority leaders lead? Do they have that potential? Maybe there's something about what the media is doing too that is shaping uh, adult and adolescents' perceptions of, of who can serve as a leader. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that the, the media is complicit, at least in our associations between good and bad and light and dark. 
as I foreshadowed before, we did this archival analysis um, that was looking at um, how are people represented in the media and are there is there are there associations between good and light and bad and dark within the media. So we looked at um, celebrity gossip magazines. We looked at celebrities that are being discussed in these in these forums. We isolated the skin, the, the visual skin um, in these photographs of people to look at are they are they portrayed as light or as dark? What how is skin tone being represented in these articles? And does that co-vary with the content of the articles that's being written about these people? So we had 34 celebrities and multiple article, many articles about each celebrity that we could analyze the skin tone and um, do a text analysis for valence. And the take this is the big takeaway here is that there is a strong correlation uh, between article valence and skin tone. When people in, in gossip forums, when celebrities are being talked about in more favorable ways, that is co-varying with photographs of them that are lighter in skin tone than when they're being talked about in negative ways. Um, and we replicated this with another analysis, uh, another database that we created looking at politicians and how are politicians represented. And what we found is the same effect when politicians are being described in the media in more positive ways, their skin tone is lighter than when they're being talked about in negative ways. So the media that we're consuming is perpetuating or reinforcing these associations between goodness and lightness. Um, and so we wondered, well, like, are kids picking up on this? Kids are not consuming political news, probably, at least in the same extent that adults are. They're consuming their own media. So we asked kids, well, what do you watch? What are the shows that you watch? And then we coded the content of those, um, those television shows to see um, uh, what proportion of the actors, of, of, the, pe of the people that, that are in the media that kids are consuming um, does that relate to this motivation to enhance their own group? So if they're seeing more darker skinned actors in the media that they're consuming, are they more motivated to enhance their home group, which then our data suggests has these downstream consequences for their support for more prototypical uh, looking leaders from their own racial group. And what we found is that there's no association between the media that kids are consuming um, and this group enhancement, their level of, of motivation to enhance their own group. Um, so, uh, yeah, and so that, that led us to think, well, probably that's not what's going to, what's, that's not what's going to explain these effects that we're finding. It's not about what kids are necessarily watching on TV or on social media. Um, it let, it made us come back to thinking more about these teacher demographics and economic need, the strat economic stratification that's happening within the schools. So presently what we're doing is, is, is trying to psychologically or motivationally unpack what this might be doing. We think that you know, having teachers of your own, that are like you, that are of your own, your same racial group, probably leads you to feel that you have more psychological resources. You have a stronger support network here that could bolster these feelings of possibility for prototypical looking leaders if you are a minority, uh, minority yourself. It might bring a sense of stability as well. So we're measuring perceived stability in people's environments. Um, that that might that might be an important factor here. And other aspect of, of resources, like that might come from their parents or close friends or from their belief about the economic or social mobility resources that they have available. Emily? So the model that we're currently working on is this. And I know that you know I'm running shy of time here. Um, but much of this is what we've talked about, that the social conditions of stability differentially shift what motivation is active for people, and that that has uh, consequences for their support for diverse looking leadership. What I've added here is what we're looking at right now, what our lab is currently trying to unpack, which is that psychological resources that can come from actually having economic resources or social support through through teacher representation in schools or from the community or from close friends might be uh, might be a moderating link here that even under conditions of instability, maybe having enough resources could could sever that connection between instability and the motivation to defend the status quo. So how do social how do psychological resources here sort of act as a buffer against what we know to be some of the detrimental effects of social conditions uh, on support for diverse leadership. 
And then we're also thinking about those times when you, when a child, when anybody might experience conditions of instability. They might not have the resources um, to, to sever those connections between, between those conditions and the defense of the status quo. And so if you find yourself in those social conditions, is there anything that we can do that will then sever this link, um, which would otherwise suggest that they won't um, us support a more diverse looking leadership? And so we're looking at different message framings framing diverse leadership actually as reifying the status quo, that through diverse leaders, through diversification, we actually can bolster um, the economic health of our country, and it is a traditional value. Uh, and so we are designing these messages that do seem to um, lead people to support diverse leadership as a means to reifying the status quo. So we're looking at two ways that we might sort of sever these connections that would otherwise lead to a lack of support for diverse looking leadership. Um, Joe, I'll come to your question in a second. Uh, okay, last thing I'll lead you with is another measure that we've included um, that we're also trying to get another way of looking at mental representations how uh, of what leadership looks like. And we're doing this especially with kids. So we're basically just giving a blank piece of paper and, and a box of crayons, what Crayola calls multicultural crayons, and asking them, draw us a picture of what a leader looks like in your mind. And so we got some really interesting drawings. And what we're interested in is what crayon do kids use when they're coloring in the, the face of their leader? Does it look like their skin tone or does it look like something different? We get a lot of different, a lot of really interesting looking um, pictures that have been a lot of fun for us to code. We are currently trying to make sense of all these data, but some preliminary results suggest that again, this motivation to enhance their own racial group um, is predicting different crayon choices for black and Hispanic students. Those that are highly motivated to, def uh, to enhance the status of their own group choose a darker crayon than those kids that are not black or Hispanic who themselves are lighter in skin tone. And it also is having effects on the masculinity of the drawing. Um, uh, uh, we're showing some interesting effects of the motivation to defend the status quo that I won't get into now, but, uh, but masculinity is also impacted here. And just because I think it's an important thing to highlight, it's an important aspect of, I think our, my, la, my moral responsibility that I have this opportunity to work with these middle school and high schoolers is that we don't wanna just study uh, who, who, who among them believe that diverse leadership is possible. We're also trying to enhance their own belief that they can be leaders. So with each of these sessions that we run with the middle school and high schoolers, we also add on an hour or two hours of leadership building workshops where we have like Janelle, a member of our team, talking to them um, about systemic racism, systemic inequality, explaining these philosophies and talking about uh, resources that are available and a changing times that are that are trying to help support a more diverse uh, uh, um, leadership and more equal promotion of more equal resources. And we do a bunch of different activities trying to um, break that stereotypic association between leadership and maleness or leadership and lightness um, by presenting case studies, stories of, and real data of, of real people that are um, amazing leaders in their field that don't fit that stereotype. Uh, talking about some aspects of growth mindset, giving them some of their most successful, most esteemed leaders, talking to them about the importance of, of hard work uh, and effort invested in the right ways having members of our own team that identify as uh, ethnic minority talking about how they overcame challenges and then just doing some fun things like presenting visual illusions, giving our participants 3D glasses and using a metaphor of, of, of seeing a different possibility is possible in your own, in your own mind. If, if you want, you can see a different future. You can see something different than what we see now. And these workshops, we're tracking the implications of it. And we see that it, it um, builds these adolescents' beliefs um, that growing leadership is possible and that they themselves belong in leadership roles from pre to post test responses. Okay, so the last thing I'm gonna leave you with is just one last example here, one last story that I think is, that I think is relevant. Um, and, and yeah, so here's the story, probably a story that you are quite familiar with. But on April 15th, 2013, three people died and 264 were injured when two bombs exploded near the finish line of the Boston Marathon. Dozens of cameras captured the moments right before those explosions. 
And that footage ended up being really important in, in, in this story that I'm about to share with you. So three days later, three days after those explosions, the FBI released this footage depicting the chief suspects. This is the footage that they, that they released, these still images from some of these cameras. A number from this footage, a number of spokespeople publicly identified these, these individuals as dark skinned. CNN's John King proclaimed that a dark skinned individual had been arrested by the FBI when they had made such an arrest. And the Boston police also made similar claims after the FBI had captured the brothers. So even when these individuals that we know in the end had committed these bombings were arrested, many institutions are, are describing these individuals as dark skinned. Members of Reddit disagreed that, that the people who were arrested were in fact the ones that had left these bombs near the finish line. And they identified a number of alternate suspects, all of whom, almost all of whom were universally dark skinned. But in truth, these individuals were far from dark skinned. They were born in Chechnya in the Caucasus region of Eastern Europe. And they were quite literally Caucasian. They weren't dark skinned individuals, but these associations that we have between dark and bad and, and light and good um, led led to these egregious um, misinformation, this egregious misinformation and misstatement of the facts while people were grappling with this incident. So these associations that we have between light and good and dark and bad permeate our social landscape. They, imp they impact our social perceptions and they affect some of the most important decisions that we make, like who we're gonna point our finger at for acts of terrorism, but also who will elevate into some of the most esteemed and powerful positions in our world. So what we're trying to do with this work is to better understand the sources of these biased visual representations on person perception that can arise within both our well-formed adult minds, but also the minds of our children who sit as the next possible generation to reverse this course of bias and leadership. So thank you to the members of my team. Thank you for the invitation to come speak with you today. today, today. And um, thank you for all the questions so far. And I would love to hear your reactions now. So yeah, normally here we'll turn it over to the Q&A. So we're just going to open the floor to anyone who has questions. And yeah, everyone just give a round, round of applause for Dr. Bacchus. Emily? Yeah. This is amazing work and really impressive, like how rich and um, varied you like address this question. I'm, I was wondering um, if you've looked at amongst white participants, um, the extent to which their attitudes predict this effect, like have you found any majority group people who show a reverse effect or, um, I mean, I guess depending on the obvious candidates to me would be like their explicit endorsement of like egalitarianism um, or like their implicitly measured racial attitudes. Um, we haven't because we've kind of s stopped looking at white people right now for the time being. So we were looking at these changes in the social context of instability. Um, and, and so, so, um, and so those people, those, yeah, those white individuals that are not motivated to enhance their, their own group don't show this, like, this strong preference for the white, uh, the lighter skinned leaders. So in a sense, that's kind of what you're getting at. Those people that are not like super pro-white, they're not out there saying like, I am proud to be white, which, I mean, that's what they're kind of asked. How proud are you to, to be white? Those people that are like, eh, not, not really. That probably co-varies with a lot of the things that you've just put on the table. But we haven't set out to systematically identify what that is. Who are the people that are not, who are white, who are not saying I'm super proud to be white. Um, but yes, there would there are those people that are out there because they are the ones that are not as strongly endorsing the lighter, the lighter skinned targets in our data. Emily, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more. I, I, just, I thought this, this uh, it, it's, it's not, it's less directly tied to your research, but this, this intervention is really interesting and important. Um, and the DV that you highlighted was sort of disagreement um, about this notion of light is good and dark is bad in the context of leaders. Um, 
but but I guess I, I was curious. It, it seemed like the intervention had as much power to be able to change the students themselves as opposed to their perceptions of others. And I was wondering if you had any additional encouraging data because it is a it is a very comprehensive intervention. So I would be surprised if it was just changing that one judgment. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so I gave that really pretty short shrift because it is sort of like a a supplement, right? It isn't explaining the bulk of what we've been talking about, which is their support for other people's aspirations. Um, to be honest, we we well, I already said we are doing that because I just I felt icky about studying kids and and then not giving anything back. Like it, you know, takes so much work to get access to these schools. It just it felt wrong to just study them and then not give their communities um, who took a risk in letting us come in to, to work with them anything that they could sort of hang their hat on and have as a takeaway. So that's why we started doing the workshops. And then I, because I'm not a school, I, I don't work in schools. I um, had never really seen children in my adult life when I started working with the kids. I was worried that I was doing something wrong. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't hurting them when we were doing these workshops. And so we added on these pre and post assessments just to make sure that like the sort of the, the skills that we thought the activities that we were using weren't backfiring. Um, because I thought that that's possible since I'm, I really don't know what I'm doing here with design with these workshops with these activities. Um, so it was out of a sense of a moral responsibility that I was, you know, trying to share our science more. Um, and, and, but you're right. So we were focusing on whether like, do you think that you can be a leader, but did not then go on to ask to like re-deliver that survey to ask them anything else. Um, but I hope it's doing more than, I hope it's doing that, that it's changing their beliefs about themselves, but also more than that, as they are poised to vote now, some of them that are in high school and the rest of them in a couple of years. Yeah, food. Um, this might be a low level question just because I didn't see anybody else something. So I wanted to just ask my question. Um, so when, um, can I, when you talked about the, the children data in schools, um, I think I was quite surprised when you actually predicted a flip and the effect in terms of Hispanic students, particularly for their target group, preferring darker skin and lighter skin candidates. And I'll, I, I'm sorry if I missed this, but I just wanted to um, ask you further about like the justification of that specifically, because obviously I'm not a member of the Black or the Hispanic community, but I, I think in at least in the Southeast Asian community, there's wide variation in light skin and so in the skin tones of um, the community community members. So I suspect that for um, for minority um, participants, I wonder if skin tone is actually something that's really indicative of the prototypicality of, of a candidate for them, a person, a member of that community for them, um, or are they relying on some other features, facial features and other things um, to signal whether that candidate is a member of their group? Yeah, so that's a really great question. And if you have thoughts on that, I would love to continue the conversation later. But we do actually have a lot of Southeast Asian students um, that we've collected data from and we had Southeast Asian targets. And frankly, we there's nothing that that would predict their um, their support for darker versus lighter leaders within the measures that we collected for Southeast Asian students, almost all of which are 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 from India or whose parents are from India with within the schools that we were testing. Um, and so in trying to understand that or to think through our predictions about what would happen with this um, with this sample of our of our students going to the literature, there's, there's just not that much about what is a pro what what constitutes a prototypical looking Southeast Asian person or Indian person in, in particular and what are the associations that are within our culture that would be known and accessible within our culture um, here that might help us make those predictions about what is good, what is what is good or what is prototypical even for this particular racial or ethnic group. Um, so we have those data and we've just put them to the side because there's just not enough in the literature for us to, to feel as confident about um, the possibilities as we do for Hispanic and Black um, individuals 
targets, groups, right? What is prototypical is clear and what is good uh, or, or bad, what are the associations is clearer within those two racial groups. So we have those data, but we can't at present um, make sense of them. Um, I have a question. So um, this maybe piggybacks off of what um, Lisa mentioned earlier, but I was thinking back to um, your slides on like whenever um, the system's like um, stable versus unstable, it seems like um, regardless of motivation, um, the white participants are um, more likely to um, have the same outcome. So, you know, preferring lighter skinned individuals over dark skinned individuals. So I guess I'm just wondering, um, if we're going to be thinking like long-term, like diversifying leadership and if um, America's majority white, um, leveraging um, factors that would change white people's um, preferences, I guess would be very useful. So I guess I'm wondering just like about your thoughts of like, how can we achieve that? And how can we kind of, what, what are those kinds of interventions looking like? Um, Thanks, Tina. That's that's a really great question, and it harkens back to what Ken, I think, was was asking as well, which I realized I didn't really touch on enough. Like, is there anything hopeful that you can say about this? <laughs> um, so, thank you for for bringing that up, Tina. I I think that I think there is a possibility here. I don't think. You know, I went into studying kids actually feeling like really, really sad about the possibility and the state of affairs. Um, I'm not so sad now because, and I'm excited because it, um, those kids that feel proud and are motivated to, 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 to enhance the status of their group are the ones that are supporting a more prototypical, which would darker skin, more prototypical looking diverse leadership. That's what these data are saying. So then that just begs the question of like, okay, well, what leads kids to feel proud or to want to enhance their own racial group? What are those factors? And I think that's more straightforward. I don't think that is as as mystifying um, a concept to try to unpack. And then just showing all the downstream consequences, like you know, having role models, having teachers of your same demographic group in your school, that probably, that probably predicts feeling proud to be who you are. So having access to more to to role models that that look like you, feeling supported in your own personal aspirations, and that can come from a variety of means. So by by seeing that it's those kids that are saying, "I'm proud to be black," while my cultural group has a lot to offer, and I want to see it do more, like those are the kids that are that are saying, "Like yes, leadership can look different." Um, so then it's just trying to see, well, how do we support that? How do we maintain those beliefs that middle schoolers? have they 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 believe that this is that this is true they are proud to be hispanic they are proud to be black and of course and that fades a little bit in high school for black students um but then they're also seeing the reality of the real world i still might be proud to be black but there aren't role models there so even if, even for those even if i'm proud to be black i don't see a possible way forward so how do we change that how, do, how can we change those and i and i don't think that that's as hard of a problem to figure out to start trying ideas to test and lots of people already have <laughs> so i don't think it's as sad of a message as i was left um feeling when in just studying adults and just to shout out or just to elevate uh Sulby, who put the question in there about competence thanks for asking that question you know we didn't measure competence but like from alex todorov's work you know i would think of all these factors sort of co, co vary right if you if you think somebody would be a good leader if you want to vote for them like he's shown it also corresponds to um represent to 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 looking competent, feeling like looks of competence, feeling competence, ratings of competence are going to co-vary with support for leadership. So we didn't measure it, but I bet if we did, it would show the same pattern. Those people that you think well of, that you represent in a more positive light, that you want to support, you probably also think are competent. Um, before we step one, if right. we have time, I was just wondering whether skin tone could change the perceived competence or perceived proficiency of the candidates given the context was especially for preference for candidate. So yeah, and I was I was also wondering whether depending on social situation, whether it is stable or unstable, maybe uh, perceived competence could also influence for the reasons why they chose or why they prefer this candidate over another. So yeah, that's why I just left the question there. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that you're right, that there, there are differences in competence that, that are going along in here um, that are important to study. And um, yeah, and it's not something that we've explicitly addressed, but a really good point, Sulby, thank you. So we are right around the time that we um, typically um, have for colloquium, but I mean, we would also love if you had, you know, some moments to say back in case people still had questions. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to give a warm thank you for you just for carving so many hours of your day um, to be with us virtually. We really appreciate your time and thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to join you. <laughs> thank you, Emily.